No, a bit slack. Oh, no, that's not good. Scott, Scott Mid Cooperative. Yay! Very noisy. Uh, the Southern Cooperative. Yes. East of England Cooperative Society. Lincolnshire Cooperative. Yay! Oh, good. <laughs> Chelmsford Star Cooperative Society. Yay! Oh, excellent. Heart of England Cooperative. The Channel Islands Cooperative Society. And Bennett in Healthcare. Oh, not very well this morning. <laughs> That's a shame. Uh, never mind. Um, but also, I'd like to thank all those who've given their time and effort in making this year so special. It's been a fantastic year. Uh, everybody has contributed, so I'd like to thank everybody in whatever, whatever shape or form that you've, you've helped. Thank you very much indeed. But most of all, I really should thank all of you who've, for coming here to celebrate 2012 with us. And secondly, that we can and will all look forward, I'm sure, to a fairer, more cooperative world in the future. So have a great Cooperative UK and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, David. We will have a series of special announcements uh, and releases this, uh, this week. The blueprint for a cooperative decade is one of those that you'll be hearing about. Another is the release of the World Cooperative Monitor, which is a relaunch of ICA's uh, Global 300 report, which historically has reported on the, the largest 300 cooperatives around the world. The World Cooperative Monitor will still include a list of the 300 largest cooperatives, but it will be much more than that. High on that list, among the world's largest cooperatives, is the Cooperative Group, which is the natural successor to the Rochdale Pioneers. And they are the other co-host of our events this week. More than, than simply being a large cooperative headquartered here in Manchester, and if you haven't seen their, their new headquarters, please do that. It's just a, a short distance down the road. We had a chance for a tour yesterday, and I'm convinced this will become one of the iconic images of cooperative modernity, showing the, the trail from the Rochdale Pioneers to what a first-class modern cooperative looks like today, the greenest building in Europe. But Cooperative group is more than simply a large cooperative. They also are an ethical cooperative. They're an exemplar of the cooperative ethic. The cooperative bank, part of the group, has been rated the world's most ethical bank. Please welcome the chairman and a member of the ICA Global Board and chair of our membership committee, Len Wardle. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very grateful to Charles for having done half my speech already. But uh, in particular, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the cooperative group to Manchester and to this very important gathering of the cooperative community. As David said, the skies may be a little gray in these parts of the world and the weather occasionally damp. But I can assure you that the city of Manchester has cooperation woven through its history in bright, gleaming threads. The resonance there is to the traditional cotton manufacturing of this city and the small towns around it. So we, the cooperative group, have been in Manchester for almost 150 years. And next year will be our birthday, 150 years. Maybe a small celebration for that. So I think it's only fair to say that as we come towards the end, almost the end, of the United Nations year of cooperatives, cooperation has come home here to Manchester. I could bore you with lots of statistics about the cooperative group, but it is unusual in that it has many and diverse businesses. And one of the important things we want to do, and do do and succeed at, is, as Charles said, our ethical policy and treating customers fairly. 
In recent years, it's been quite clear that the old model of capitalism has lost the trust of the people. So therefore, values, old-fashioned values of fairness and responsibility and the importance of community have been reawakened. So today, you don't need to hide away the Rochdale pioneers in dusty history books. Their values are as relevant today as they were when they started. I hope you have a very wonderful week. It's an important opportunity for us to talk to colleagues from places we probably haven't even heard of. We need to exchange views and exchange values. I apologize to the interpreters because I'm not following a speech. <laughs> Let me just finish by giving you two quotations. The first, where there is no vision, the people perish. It is our duty as cooperators to give the world that vision. The second quotation, for I dipped into the future far as human eye could see, saw a vision of the world and all the wonder that would be. Alfred Lord Tennyson, let us together create that wonder. Thank you, Lynn. We set out a year ago to ensure that cooperatives around the world use this year to raise our public awareness and to ensure that they embrace the International Year of Cooperatives logo and slogan. And one year ago, it wasn't clear that that would happen. We had early negotiations with the UN to ensure that cooperative businesses weren't precluded from using the, the logo that the UN had developed and which is generally not available for commercial purposes. We worked hard with them to define that appropriately for our enterprise model. We negotiated to make sure that the use process for the logo and slogan was straightforward and easy to access. And we all eventually worked through early concerns around cooperative spelled with a hyphen and cooperative spelled without a hyphen and the translation of the slogan. And the momentum grew and the logo appeared on shopping bags and t-shirts and keychains and flash drives. And it appeared on newsletters to cooperators and magazines to the, to the public in adverts. It appeared on podiums where national leaders spoke in important conventions around the world. But there's one place we never imagined it would appear. And we want to thank the cooperator from Nepal who led a group to the top of Mount Everest and there unfurled a banner with the logo of the International Year on it. <clears throat> and I know that Mr. Shiva Kumar Danji, who led that, uh, that group, uh, was going to try to be with us in Manchester. I don't know if, he, if he's made his way into the auditorium, but if so, if you would uh, stand up. Nope, I don't think he made it into the auditorium, but we will make sure that uh, we extend your, uh, your appreciation to him. <laughs> When the uh, United Nations International Year of Cooperatives was launched in New York last year, as I said, one year ago today, at a plenary session of the UN General Assembly, ICA's president, Dame Pauline Green, spoke to the member state delegations there. And she told them what we intended to do with the year. And she told them what we need, and she told them, moreover, what we expect from them. A more balanced global economy, equal promotion of the shareholder, of the cooperative model with the shareholder model, and full recognition of the specific and unique legal and regulatory framework that the cooperative model requires in public policy. And it was a moment of great pride for everyone who has worked to advance the cooperative. But it didn't stop there. 
and Dame Pauline has traveled to every part of the world this year to speak at national events, to meet with national and global political leaders, to encourage cooperators on the ground, and even in this final run-up to this busy week of events here at Cooperatives United. I don't believe she's been in her native UK for more than a handful of days. And those who have heard her speak, and I'm not sure who hasn't heard her speak this year, <laughs> know her to be not only tireless, but an articulate and powerful spokeswoman for the cooperative message. Please welcome ICA's president, Dame Pauline Green. fellow cooperators. It really is a great pleasure, a joy and a delight to be able to welcome you to Cooperatives United here in my own United Kingdom to the movement of which I'm so proud to be a part. But I'm here today to bring you the warmest greetings of the International Cooperative Alliance. But actually perhaps much more important than that to bring you the really warm greetings and solidarity of your fellow one billion cooperators around the world who own this great movement of ours. And I want to begin this morning by reiterating thanks from myself and from the ICA to our co-hosts for this event, Cooperatives UK, of which I was very proud for 10 years to be the chief executive, and I'm delighted to see it growing from strength to strength under its new Gen Secretary General, Ed Mayo, and his team. And I know that they have made great efforts to make this event a success by bringing, for instance, their own annual meeting, which normally happens in June, here to this week, and bringing the footfall and the people and the, and the buzz that goes around that annual meeting here to join with us in Cooperatives United. Their staff have been tireless in their commitment uh, and their drive to make this a success. So thank you very much Cooperatives UK for all that work and to all the staff for what they're doing today and all this week. But I am sure that Cooperatives UK would join with me in saying that if it were not for our third co-host, the cooperative group, this event simply would not have happened. This event has been underwritten, it's been designed, and it's been driven by the resources and the support of the cooperative group. And the people you're seeing around the place in the red t-shirts uh, have come from all parts of the cooperative group's uh, services across the country to support this event, a great group of volunteers. Following what we did with volunteers in the Olympic Games this year, I think this is becoming something of a habit for the UK uh, to do, but it's great to see people from all over the UK helping to make this event work. And I want to say a very big thank you to Peter Marks and Len Wardle and their team and all their staff for the work they've done, the commitment, the energy, uh, and overwhelmingly their humor and enthusiasm as this year has gone by. It's not been easy, but it's gonna be a great event. Thank you very much, Peter, and all, all your staff. <laughs> Dear fellow cooperators, since 2000, I've been privileged to work within the UK movement and to witness at first hand the way the movement rededicated itself to the virtuous circle of cooperative business and also to the movement's principles and values, its democratic ownership model, active membership policy and ethical and values-led business ethos. And as a result here in the UK, we have seen a renaissance of cooperative activity which has seen the co-op economy in the last four years, when our own domestic economy has been in recession, uh, and where so many families and people have been so desperately hurt and lost so much of their aspiration and hope, we have seen the cooperative economy here in the UK grow by nearly 20% across those four years. I've been very proud, as I've already said, to be a member of this great movement, but I think it's indicative this country and what's happened with the co-op movement of what has been happening across the world. This 
United Nations Year, International Year of Cooperatives has been a fabulous year. As I visited the movement across the world, I can't help but being struck by the huge impact on the movement, first of all, of the year. Chuck has already described very clearly the impact of the use of the UN logo and slogan. Cooperative enterprises build a better world. What a great slogan. It doesn't impinge on anyone's personal branding, which would always have been difficult, but it adds to our values. It adds to the sense publicly of who we are in the minds of, of, the, of the public across the world. Never before in its history has the cooperative movement globally coalesced around a single logo and slogan. We have never in our history been as cohesive as we are now at this moment. This event, as you have heard, had 90 countries represented and huge numbers of cooperators. Just three weeks ago, in Quebec City, there were nearly 3,000 cooperators from 90 countries gathered to, to celebrate the first ever World Cooperative Economic Summit. It was a huge success, and I want to thank Monique LaRue from Desjardins and her staff who hosted that event because it put us on the same footing as the Davos Summit, and now we are set to continue that with the support of Desjardins. And yesterday, uh, the, or the day before, the board of, of the ICA themselves agreed to continue with the co-hosting with Desjardins of a 2014 Cooperative Economic Summit. And that will be happening uh, again in Quebec City, and we hope once again to see the movement come there. There was some hugely good research put out which showed the strengths the opportunities for the movement, but also our challenges. And that's something we have to work together to overcome, and we can do as the momentum from this year uh, grows. We also, this year, not only have seen a great cohesion in our movement, but we've seen a great understanding within the movement, a growth in understanding in the movement of the size, the significance, and the impact of the cooperative business on the global economy. And I sensed and felt, as I've gone around the world, this huge increase in confidence amongst cooperators as they begin to sense the strength of a billion people around them, the strength of a movement that across the world employs over 100 million people, providing support, livelihood, aspiration, and hope for those families. We've seen recognition that we have the capacity and determination not just to enjoy this year, but to do more. There's been a tremendous momentum built up, and we, this present generation of cooperators gathered in this room, must not allow that momentum to be lost. And of course we know our excitement about this year, our growth coincides with the financial collapse and the economic recession, which has cast a pall across all of the world in the developed economies, ours is, no, is a very good example here in the UK. We see recession, we see vulnerable people being exposed as their support is cut uh, from government and from local authorities as they struggle to meet the demands of the austerity packages that will ensure that budget deficits are met. And this is the same across, across the world, across the developed world. And then there's the airplane economies, those countries where the economies are taking off. Even there, there are strains and tensions created, A, by the lack of some of their export markets to the developed world, but also as they grow and we see the complexities of trying to modernize countries literally overnight in the scale, in the scale of, of, of the world time. Uh, and we see the problems created by massive urbanization very quickly uh, across those countries and working conditions uh, which are not of the best often. So there's a lot of issues still to be sorted out in those countries where the economies are developing very rapidly. And of course we all know that in the developing world they too have been hit by recession. 
uh, and those, they too uh, are still struggling in so many parts of the world, and I think particularly of Africa, where I was just last week, just a few days ago, talking to 18 ministers from African countries who are working to develop cooperatives as a key example uh, of uh, uh, of the way in which they can help their eco economies to grow. I was in Rwanda, where since that dreadful genocide that hit that country uh, such a short time ago, the brand new cooperative movement has grown to 8% of the, of the GDP of Rwanda already and is motoring and driving because it appeals to ordinary folk. And out of these difficult circumstances comes opportunity for the cooperative movement. We know, cooperators, that cooperative banks, credit unions have not collapsed. They are not in receipt of government bailouts, and they do not have huge uh, debt to national taxpayers. Our arguments for the diversification of the global economy have begun to find traction amongst global decision makers on the back of what was clearly the resilience and sustainability of our financial model across these last four years, five years. Our arg arguments for our model of business, which puts people at the heart of economic decision-making and doesn't leave them at their mercy, is beginning to be heard uh, by global, regional and national decision-makers. I've had the great opportunity to share our political messages with governments and parliaments across the world. From the White House in Washington with a seminar organized by the Obama administration, to the Great Hall of the People in Beijing with the Chinese government and 300 officials uh, from government departments in China looking how they can lift 600 million people in rural poverty in China through the help of the cooperative model from the Latin American members of parliament who met in Panama City to the Australian uh, parliament in Canberra, from the European institutions in Brussels to a meeting of 18 ministers responsible for co-ops in the Asia-Pacific region, meeting in Bangkok, and to a different meeting la just last week, as I've said, with 18 ministers from African governments in Rwanda, uh, and that was just a few days ago. As, as you know, it was suggested to me, oh, uh, you should know that it was suggested to me by a reporter that when I talk about the cooperative model of business being able to support the growth uh, of the global economy and demanding that actually we need to be heard, for instance, why is it that there's not a single cooperative economist on the board of the World Bank? Why is it that when the G20 meets and they have a meeting of the B20 alongside them, uh, there is no, not a single cooperative business represented in the B20, the business advisory group, that stands alongside the G20. I went through on the internet every single one of the 125 businesses that went to the B20 meeting when the G20 last met. Not one cooperative or even mutual business amongst them. And that simply will not do. We represent a billion people and we deserve to be heard in those forums that are dictating how the global economy develops. But I'm told that when I make this case, it's all very well but it's idealistic. And I have to say to you, colleagues, that one billion people can't be wrong. That one billion people are not starry-eyed idealists. They are realists. They are realists because they know that cooperatives put food in their children's stomachs, brings electricity to their villages, gives them insurance when the traditional insurance sector will have nothing to do with them, gives them a job, perhaps markets their farm products, allows them to save with a SACO or a credit union or a cooperative bank, uh, allows them to take loans from those institutions that supports their children's education or puts their micro business on the next rung of the ladder of success. This is cooperatives active in the real economy, supporting people, their families and their communities. So dear colleagues, are we going at the end of this year just to shake hands and say, what a great year, and go back to our previous existence as if this year has never happened? 
Or are we going to maintain our momentum from this great year, this rich gift that the United Nations has given us, this international year of cooperatives and what it has meant to us? The ICA is determined to capture this moment. This is our moment and we must not let it pass us by. And so I'm delighted this morning to launch the ICA's blueprint for a cooperative dec decade. It will be on the stalls and stands. You can pick it up. Uh, and I think some of you have already received it in your packages. This is to support a worldwide campaign to, make, to take the cooperative way of doing business to a new level. It's an ambitious plan in the blueprint. It's for the cooperative model of business by 2012, 2020, I beg your pardon, we are writing for 2020, where we want to see the cooperative business become the acknowledged leader of social, economic, and environmental sustainability, and thereby the model preferred by people, and thereby the fastest growing model of enterprise by 2020. The blueprint will be discussed this afternoon in more detail at the General Assembly uh, of the International Cooperative Alliance, but I give formal notice now of its launch as our key tool for taking forward the work of the international year to build, as the slogan says, a better world. I have another announcement for you, and that was introduced briefly by the Director General, Charles Gould, because I'm pleased to announce today some of the latest evidence that we have that shows the growing momentum of our movement. The new World Cooperative Monitor, a document published by the ICA in conjunction and in partnership with the European Research Institute on Cooperatives and Social Enterprise, Eurixi, which is based at the University of Trento in Italy. The World Cooperative Men Monitor, as Chuck said, is the successor to the Global 300, which we've published for some years. And amongst the things listed uh, will include the largest 300 cooperatives. The World Cooperative Monitor database, now over 2,200 strong, shows that of those 2,200, nearly 1,500 of our database cooperatives have turnover of more than 100 million US dollars. What's more, the largest 300 are this year, 2010 figures in fact, worth together just under two trillion US dollars. 1.97 trillion US dollars. <laughs> Taken together, colleagues, these statistics alone demonstrate that cooperative businesses are not only to be found at village level across the world, supporting rural communities, but also are much are huge multi-billion dollar businesses easily able to compete with their stockholder competitors and succeed. The World Cooperative Monitor you will also be able to pick up on the ICA stand just inside the main entrance of the expo and, re and see for yourself the strength and significance of our businesses across the world. I also have another uh, perhaps more domestic initiative to announce, of which we're extremely proud, may not have global significance, although it does for the International Cooperative Alliance, and that is that when we had our special General Assembly in Rome, unanimously the uh, members meeting there in 2008 at a special General Assembly asked the ICA to look and see how it could diversify its income streams so that we were not so totally dependent on the income of our members. I'm sure that's something you will all want to take, you will all take to heart. And I'm now able to tell you uh, of two such initiatives that we have undertaken, uh, and a new one in particular of which you won't have heard. The first, of course, uh, was uh, this arrangement to, with WTM to run uh, the ICA Expos, a, three, a contract for three ICA Expos, of which this is the third. Uh, and you will visit, I hope will visit and enjoy what we think is the third and so far the best of, of three, the other two already having set very high standards. 
But last year, talks began with Mid-Counties Cooperatives here in the United Kingdom with a view to ICA acquiring the dot co-op domains registry and registrar from them. And I'm delighted to tell you that on the 1st of August this year, both registrar and registry uh, were acquired by the ICA. In fact, they were sold to us by mid-counties uh, for one British pound each. It does not reflect their value. In fact, they are substantial small businesses. It reflects the fact that mid-counties, its board and its chief executive, Ben Reid, were prepared to gift aid, basically, those businesses to the ICA as they felt it was a much more natural fit with the ICA than with their own business mix. And I want to acknowledge the Mid-Counties Board and its Chief Executive, Ben Reid, for giving us this business, which will give us uh, a significant income stream each year and help us on the way to diversifying our income stream. So Mid-Counties, if you're here, please do stand up. We're immensely grateful. Thank you. Stand up, come on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Just to, to uh, add to that, Mid Counties also gave us uh, an additional £25,000 to enable us to, to go through the first uh, uh, cash flow issues in the first few weeks. So, an added bonus, and thank you so very much. You can see, fellow cooperators, that across the world, the movement is coalescing around the need for us to drive a global agenda for our movement. Never was it needed more than at this, move, at this moment. Fellow cooperators, in closing, let me make clear again what an important watershed this year has been for our movement. We see the rise of support across the world. We have had huge success in putting the cooperative model of business into the Rio Plus 20 Treaty in for the climate change that was agreed uh, in Rio de Janeiro earlier this year. Three mentions of our model of business are supporting agricultural development, employment, and international development in that treaty, giving us access to following regimes and funding regimes to support uh, work for climate change. So we're making progress on that. We're also making progress through the support uh, of uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization, whose new-ish new, new now director is to be our keynote speaker today. And I must say uh, that he has driven the cooperative movement back through the FAO across the world with clear instructions to his staff to help support the growth of cooperatives in agriculture. And I think this is the sort of initiative we want to see at global level to drive our movement upwards and onwards and this event uh, gives us the choice the chance here for all of us you are the voice of the billion out there ladies and gentlemen this week we want that voice to be heard loudly and clearly across the world so that people understand the size the relevance the and the, and the impact of our movement but also the joy and support it gives to families across the world thank you very much very great pleasure now to introduce you uh, to Monique Leroux. She, Monique is the president and CEO of Desjardins, and I told you about the, um, the, the World Cooperative Economic Summit that took place in Quebec City uh, just three weeks ago, uh, and Monique led that uh, event with great eloquence, and, uh, and we have a very good outcome from it and she's going to talk to you for just a few moments about that uh, that great event thank you very much monique Now we have to cooperate in order to create the future. Good evening.
Well, it was uh, quite a, a big event, and I can uh, still uh, feel the positive energy of this, uh, of this summit. And I've been told that uh, it uh, just might have shaken up the traditional economic world, and that's very good news. So, Dame Pauline, ICA board members and officials, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to present to you, on behalf of the co-hosts of the summit, the Quebec Declaration from the International Summit of Cooperatives that was held last month in historic Quebec City. It is also a great privilege for me to be here with you in historic Manchester for Cooperatives United. Both events are a milestone in what has been an amazing international year of cooperatives, and it is not over yet. Today, I want to share with you the main results from the summit and the major elements of the declaration. But first, I would like to take this opportunity to personally thank Dan Pauline Green and Charles Gould for providing such great support as co-hosts of the summit. We would not have achieved such success without your help and partnership. I would like also to thank the other ICA representative who provided great support in your own regions and countries. And I would like also to thank everyone in the audience today who attended the summit. The level of involvement and participation was very impressive. So thank you to all of you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. It was to provide cooperatives and mutuals with a forum, an economic forum, where we could discuss our key business challenges a forum where we could work together to develop ideas and solutions, a forum to reinforce our contributions to our members and communities around the world and become better cooperative enterprises, a forum where we could make contacts with other cooperative organizations and share best practices to promote growth, performance, and innovation. A forum to demonstrate the strength of the cooperative movement and the amazing power of cooperatives. And finally, a forum to promote the cooperative business model on a global, political, and economical stage. In many ways, and I agree, the concept was similar to the World Economic Forum in Davos, but it was designed for and about the cooperative sector. And it was an urgent reminder that because of their proven resilience and stability, cooperatives are a key part of the solution to the current economic crisis. The summit included presentations from some of the world's top economists and most innovative thinkers. It included detailed panel discussions involving cooperative leaders from every sector and every region of the world. And it included groundbreaking research and surveys. This helped us better understand where we are today and where we need to go in the future. Throughout the summit, information was collected and the discussions were summarized. And from this, the Quebec Summit Declaration was put together. Let me tell you very briefly some of the key elements of the Quebec Declaration. All participants acknowledge the contribution cooperatives make to society and to a more balanced, pluralistic economy because we, co-op leaders, are committed to our communities for the long term. We get people involved in managing the business. We promote job creation and retention in the communities we serve. We strive to be profitable, not as an end in itself, but, not, but really to effectively need and invest for the needs of our current members and future generations. 
We use a business model that is solid and viable at the local, national, and international levels, and we are very resilient as the current financial and economic crisis has shown. That's the amazing power of cooperatives. Cooperatives are people-focused businesses that play a significant role in the global economy while ensuring sustainable development and prosperity. That's all good, but we can rest on our levels. And the Quebec Declaration highlights some of the things we must do to continue to grow and strengthen the cooperative sector. First, to ensure the full potential of cooperatives in a fragile economy, we must maintain our competitiveness, sustain our performance, be innovative, and respond to emerging needs. Second, we must ensure our growth by remaining close to our members, becoming more agile in meeting current and future needs, and developing new collaborations and partnerships among our cooperative organization around the world. Third, because our cooperative model has demonstrated its ability to succeed, and especially during difficult times, this positions us to play a stronger role internationally. But to do it, there must be greater visibility of cooperative achievements, greater understanding of our cooperative responses to the challenges and limitation of current economic models, and greater attention to issues such as education and succession to prepare and better involve the young emerging leaders in our movement. I know that sounds like we have a lot of work to do, but we know what needs to be done and we are building from a position of strength. Overall, the Quebec Declaration makes a solid case for a strong and dynamic cooperative sector taking a much more important role and contributing to a more stable, pluralistic economy. At the end of the summit, we encourage all participants to review the document, to review the declaration, and to submit their ideas on the overall objectives and ambitions. We receive many comments, and we will include all of them with the Quebec Declaration when we present it to the United Nations. That will happen in about three weeks on behalf of all of us, Dan Pauline Green and I will go to New York, and we will proudly present as co-hosts of the summit the Quebec Declaration at the official closing ceremony of the United Nations International Year of Cooperative 2012. But this is not the end. I fully support ICA's vision to convert the International Year of Cooperatives into a blueprint for a global cooperative decade. Ladies and gentlemen, it is to us as leaders of the cooperative sector to keep the momentum growing. It is up to us to keep building success upon success. And it is up to all of us to keep inspiring and influencing others. Clearly, this is our time. This will be our decade and even, I believe, our century. Dame Pauline, it is now my proud duty to officially present to you as the president of the International Cooperative Alliance the declaration of the Quebec International Summit of Cooperative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much indeed, Monique, and I'm sure you had a glimpse uh, from the video of the strength of that uh, operation and from what Monique has said, uh, the leadership that Desjardins have given uh, to the summit and ho hopefully to future summits, and we will make sure that this is uh, carried through with the United Nations. It's my great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker. and. Uh, you know, we were thinking about this international year and wondering 
what would be one of the enduring legacies from it. And one of those things was to try and find a financial vehicle that would allow us to keep driving cooperative growth across the world. And I'm sure that Paul Flowers is now thinking, she's giving all my words away, so I'm gonna say no more, but to introduce you to Paul Flowers, who is the chair of the Cooperative Banking Group, uh, and who is the chair of the steering group of the Global Cooperative Development, uh, which it's been uh, my pleasure to work with him and others on. Paul, the floor is yours. I've been sitting where you have for the last hour and a half or so, and I've been given five minutes, so I will try and make it briefer, so that purgatory doesn't go on for too much longer. Um, I'm conscious that this has been a quite splendid year, but I believe that we need to do something with that year. I'm also conscious that during this year, it does seem to me that there has been a considerable shift away from looking back, sometimes with uh, rose-tinted spectacles, sometimes with a degree of uh, well-placed or sometimes misplaced nostalgia, to a clear recognition of who we are as a cooperative movement globally and what we might become as a cooperative movement globally we have begun to feel more confident in ourselves. And we need to take that confidence beyond this year into the plans that the ICA has and the dreams that many of us in this room and outside this room have for the development of this cooperative model. So, Pauline is quite correct. A year ago, we launched during the celebrations in New York the uh, opportunity for us to have a Global Development Cooperative Fund. During the year, we have made substantial and good progress in how that fund could develop. Very broadly, it is a very simple idea. The simple idea is that we invite large cooperatives, medium-sized cooperatives, small cooperatives, every cooperative to contribute modest investments towards a fund and that that fund should then be packaged in such a way that it offers soft and low interest loans to those in the developing world who wish to develop cooperatives especially where they do not have the capital that they may need. The focus of that fund in its first phase will specifically be about the provision of affordable finance for agricultural cooperatives in Africa. And this key group is not only amongst the poorest in the world, but it is also amongst those where we need to be seen to be working alongside them to develop cooperatives. Others have spoken on this platform and in some of the film footage as well about dreams. Well, I have a dream for you. And the dream is that rather than just be an organization that talks to itself and then talks to the outside world a great deal, we should also have a true legacy that we may build on year after year after year after year and which takes this year and its celebrations seriously into the future. Let me tell you why I believe that's important. It says on the tin that we are an international cooperative alliance. That seems to me to suggest that we should act as an alliance, that we should act in a way which enables those who need us to work with them. In this country, a number of us for many years have applied a certain political slogan. Some of you may recognize it. From each according to their ability to each according to their need. 
and I suggest to you that this Global Development Cooperative Fund needs to have that principle at the very heart of it. The ICA and this year has to mean much, much more than us simply being nice to each other. It has to mean much, much more than a number of us having opportunities to fly around the world and experience a warm glow about the cooperatives of which we're a part. What it needs to do is to wake up to the massive and acute needs that there are in many of the parts of the world represented here, but also many of the parts of the world not represented here. We have a duty and a responsibility to make certain that we work with cooperators in the poorest parts of the world and make certain that their cooperatives become as vibrant and as strong as ours are today. <laughs> so my message to you is that we have the capacity to help change this world for the better within our own cooperative model. I wish you to reassess your opportunity to contribute to this fund. And over the next few days, Pauline and I especially will do a sort of soft cop and hard cop routine. She's the hard cop and I'm the soft one. Uh, and we, we, we may well sidle up to you as a duo and make a, a, an improper suggestion in your ear about the amount of money that you may wish to be make available to this particular initiative. If you wish to avoid that opportunity, then you have to come to us with your checkbooks and with your credit cards, and we will happily take the money from you. I'm serious. This is a very important opportunity, and we cannot let it pass us by. We must preserve this year with a legacy of which we can be justifiably proud. And I appeal to your sense of cooperation for the entire globe that we make this the best that we can. Thank you very much. Paul, thank you for that, uh, for that challenge. And Monique, thank you for the declaration and for the vision you had for the summit. And Pauline, thank you, as always, for your inspiring words. The three co-hosts for this week have uh, all welcomed you here, and I'm pleased to say that now we will all be welcomed to Manchester by the leader of the Manchester City Council, Sir Richard Leese. Uh, Sir Richard has held that post for two decades and the cooperators here in Manchester and, and in the UK who know these things tell me that he is the man responsible for transforming Manchester into the, the modern multicultural exemplar of urban leadership that it is today. The Cooperatives UK is headquartered here in Manchester as is the Cooperative Group. The Cooperative Group is the largest employer in Manchester. And so these two organizations are both beneficiaries of and instigators for that transformation. The new group headquarters that I mentioned earlier uh, will, I believe, become an iconic image for cooperatives, but probably also for the city of Manchester. And we heard yesterday plans for further development called NOMA, which will transform the, the northern quadrant of Manchester, which is a, a center of, of cooperative, um, cooperative uh, business. So here to welcome us to this great and historic city is Sir Richard Lees. Uh, thank you, um, 
Good morning, colleagues. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you here to uh, Manchester Central, to Manchester, on behalf of the City of Manchester and Manchester City Council. Uh, the cooperative movement has been at the heart of Manchester economically, socially, environmentally, and politically, going right back to the roots of the modern cooperative uh, movement in uh, Rochdale, just a few kilometres up the road, right through to what's been just been talked about, the magnificent new headquarters for the cooperative group at One Angel Square, on the other side of the city centre, which will be environmentally uh, one of the most sustainable buildings anywhere in the world. Um, talked about politically, and uh, uh, for us as a uh, city council, not so long ago, that members, there were so many members of the cooperative uh, movement, so many members of the cooperative party, that we required special dispensation to be able to make decisions about the co-op estate at the uh, north, of, north of the city centre. Say, so, the co-op is at the heart of this uh, city. Socially and economically, of course, it is the cooperative movement that led uh, on ethical trade on fair trade long before it became uh, fashionable. The co-op bank here has led on uh, ethical investment policies, which is why uh, increasingly thousands on thousands of people have moved to the co-op. I talked about the new headquarters setting new environmental standards. Uh, also yesterday in Manchester, uh, we launched the Manchester Carbon Literacy uh, Programme. We had the first graduates, or some of the first graduates of that programme, and it should be at no surprise that amongst those first graduates of the Manchester Carbon Literacy uh, Programme were employees from the co-op here, uh, here in the city. And it's also been referred to uh, uh, the co-op is a major provider of employment in Manchester uh, and uh, a growing provider of, empl uh, uh, of employment. Over the last decade or so, the transformation of the co-op co has mirrored that of the city. This is a city that over uh, a couple of decades has been transformed from an old industrial city. I know in parts of the world we're still perceived as uh, being that. We're still perceived as being cottonopolis. That changed a long, long time ago, and we are now a modern city with a diverse econ economy. We have a transformed city centre and some of the best modern architecture that you will see uh, anywhere in the world complementing our magnificent Victorian architecture and the new co-op headquarters will be uh, a major addition to that modern architecture. We have transformed neighbourhoods, neighbourhoods where uh, people want to live. Our population has grown after years of decline by 20% over the last decade. We're investing heavily in infrastructure. You can see uh, the trams going past this building. There are new, uh, four new light rail tram lines being built as we speak. And we're also investing in heavy rail, in buses, in our airport. And by the way, you can fly from Manchester Airport to more international destinations than from any other UK airport, more than Heathrow uh, e e even. Uh, our universities, we have the two largest universities in the UK here in, here in Manchester amongst our five uh, universities, and it is those universities that are helping us drive the knowledge economy. Um, there are a whole host of developments within the city, and I hope you'll have some chance to see some of them. We have the Sharp Project at the leading edge of digital technology. Airport City, uh, using a, a massive logistics hub to develop new industries. The Corridor, where our universities and the biggest hospital in the UK lie, developing a whole range of new science-based industries, including uh, around graphene, a revolutionary material discovered uh, there. Siemens pioneering wind technology and bringing uh, alternative power to the, uh, to the nation. And in sport and recreation, the Etihad campus. 
Uh, with all these developments supported by the work we're doing in partnership with the cooperative, cooperative group in the NOMA development, we are helping lead the UK out of recession and doing it in such a way that Manchester people benefit. This is not about growth for growth's sake. This is growth that is reflected improved life standards for the people of the city, the people I represent. So, uh, enjoy your stay. Uh, I hope that uh, in, on future occasions uh, as a city we will be able to welcome many of you back here again because this is a city where cooperators will always be welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Richard. This is a city that is central to cooperative history but also to cooperative modern thought and practice. We appreciate your taking such good care of it uh, for us. I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, the Director General of Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, generally known as the FAO. This is the Director General Jose Graziano de Silva. The FAO has a mission that is of primary relevance to cooperatives, and that is to achieve food security for all. We know that food insecurity is one of the greatest challenges the world faces today. And as Director General, Mr. Graziano de Silva leads the world's primary institution charged with solving that problem. He's new to this role, having assumed office January 1st of this year, but he's not new to cooperatives. He hails from Brazil, where he has seen firsthand the impact of agricultural cooperatives. When he took office, one of his first directives was to reach out to cooperatives. In his first months, he put in place a memorandum of understanding with ICA, which gives us access to the FAO so that we can advocate for cooperatives to member states and to FAO program staff. He's created a liaison for cooperatives within the FAO structure so that there's a champion inside FAO, ensuring that the cooperative model is well known and that is kept top of mind with FAO staff and experts. The relationship between ICA and the FAO has never been stronger. Mr. Graziano de Silva has worked on issues of food security, rural development, and agriculture for over 30 years. In 2001, he led the team that designed Brazil's Zero Hunger Program and he later was charged with this implementation. The Zero Hunger Program has helped lift 28 million people out of extreme poverty, and it inspired a new set of public policies aimed at promoting economic and social development in Brazil. He holds a bachelor's degree in agronomy, a master's degree in rural economics and sociology, and a PhD in economic sciences. In addition, he has two postgraduate doctorate degrees, in Latin American studies and in environmental studies. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Jose Graziano de Silva. President of International Cooperative Alliance, ICA, Charles Gould, Director General of ICA, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to the World Festival and International Cooperative Third Global Expo. As many of you know, just two weeks ago, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, put the spotlight on cooperatives during its World Food Day celebrations around the globe. This year's World Food Day team was agriculture cooperatives key to feed the world. It was a well-deserved recognition, especially in 2012, the International Years of Cooperative. FAO sees cooperatives and producer organization are crucial partners 
in the fight against hunger and malnutrition. Anywhere in the world, cooperatives follow core values and principles that are critical to doing business in an equitable manner that seek to empower and benefit its members and the community it is inserted in. This is especially relevant in poor rural communities where joint forces are central to promoting sustainable local development. In the case of agriculture, you help small and medium scale farmers, fish folk and others add value to their production and gain access to local and global markets. You open doors for small and medium producers that otherwise would remain closed. There is no way out for small scale producer except cooperatives and organization of the production. Thanks to this organization, many producers are taking part in the first time in policy making discussion that affect their lives. This is important from the local and global level. Cooperatives are an excellent tool for social and economic development. Whether you are in the UK, Brazil, Kenya, Thailand, Nepal, cooperatives help to generate employment and boost national economies. This in turn helps to improve food security. This is a challenge all of us need to be involved with. The latest figures on hunger released by FAO, IFED, and WFP three weeks ago show that the world has made some progress in the fight against hunger. The global number of hungered people has declined by 130 million since 1990, and now stands around 870 million. The proportion of population in the world that's a nourish is also down from 19 to 12 percent. This means that we may still reach the Millennium Development Goal of reducing by half the proportion of hungry people in the world. But only if we step up our efforts. But this is not enough. Even if we reach the Millennium Development Goals, we will still have half a billion people undernourished in 2015. There are men, women, and children who go hungry every day, either because they don't have money to buy food or they lack access to natural research to produce it. But we are seeing that different regions have different trends in reducing hunger. In Asia and Latin America, the number of hungry people fell by almost 200 million. On the other hand, we are losing the battle in Africa. We now have more 83 million unnourished people in Africa and the Near East regions than we had in, in 1990. That means a total of 2,075 million people in Africa and Arab countries that are nourished. This is not acceptable in a world that already produces enough food for all. The only acceptable number for Hungary is zero. This is why we support the Zero Hunger Challenge launched by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in the Rio Plus 20 conference. This challenge means making sure that our food systems are sustainable. It means making sure that smallholders can increase their productivity and income. It means cutting down the high levels of food waste and making sure that our people have year-round access to nutrition, to nutritious food. If we do this, we can put an end to malnutrition 
in pregnancy and childhood stunting. FAO has embraced this challenge. I urge the cooperatives movement to do the same. We can together defeat hunger if we join our force, and by we, I mean governance, international organization, civil society, private sector, farmers organization, and of course, cooperatives. Ladies and gentlemen, cooperatives are already helping us to improve food security in many different ways. But we can do much more. Last May, FAO appointed two special ambassadors for cooperatives. A small farmer from Cameroon, Madame Elisabetta Tangana, and a world champion of cooperatives, Mr. Roberto Rodriguez from Brazil, who will receive the Rodshale Pioneers Award tonight. On the International Day of Cooperatives last July, I inaugurated an office space for cooperatives and producer organizations with the ICA is sharing with the World Farmers Organization in our headquarters in Rome. Also, FAO is a storehouse of technical knowledge on cooperatives and enterprise development. We have developed a number of guidelines, methodologies, and training tools on organizational development and policy support for use at country and regional level. All of us here have accomplished a great deal during the International Year of Cooperative. We are now looking at how to use the momentum created to increase our collaboration. As we look to the road ahead, I urge all you to contribute to the global plan of action which will come out of the International Year of Cooperatives. The United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs is leading the process to include principles and guidelines for action, a research agenda, and policy recommendation for the next 10 years. The Dunsani Declaration for Rural Cooperative Development offers a forward-looking perspective and gives an important contribution to the global plan of action that will guide our work in future years. At FAO, we will work to keep cooperatives on the international development agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, I also want to highlight the direct link that exists between cooperatives and family farming. We are already exploring this link in the International Year of Cooperatives. I hope that we continue doing so in the near future, especially in the International Year of Family Farmer that will be commemorated in 2014. I invite you to continue work close with FAO to promote the International Year of Family Farming. Before closing, I would like to recall the message of Pope Benedict XVI sent to us on World Food Day. Reflecting on the choice to highlight the role of cooperatives in feeding the world, the Pope said, and I quote, it's not only a matter of giving support to them as economic and social organizations, but also to consider then a veritable instrument for international action. The experience of many countries shows, in fact, that in addition to the impetus they give to farming cooperatives are the means to enable farmers and rural populations to intervene at crucial moment. and at the same time are an effective way to achieve this integral development of which the personal 
is both the foundation and the goal. And I end the quote. I fully agree with this word. As you might know, last May, the Committee on World Food Security endorsed the voluntary guidelines on a governance of tenure. The cooperatives movement played a key role in this participation process that took two years all around the world. The Committee on World Food Security, or CFS, will now discuss the principle for responsible agriculture investments. It's a very important that these negotiations take place in the framework of the CFS. Why? For a simple reason, the participation of government, civil society, private sector, and other actors make this forum the most participative and inclusive multilateral forum to discuss food security that we have now in the world. But only agreeing, agreeing on recommendations of the voluntary guidelines is not enough. We need now to follow up that by implementing them at national level will have effect. I invite the cooperative movement to participate in this effort to implement the voluntary guidelines at country level. They can help protect the rights of rural and indigenous communities, and they will ensure that much, that the much needed investments in agriculture in developing countries help promote food security of the poor population, many of whom are members of cooperatives themselves. And I welcome the initiative of Paul just presented for this uh, uh, fund uh, for especially designed for Africa. Let me leave you with one last thought. When I nominate the FAO Special Ambassador for Cooperatives, Mr. Rodriguez, he launched the idea that the cooperatives movement should be awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize. Given your contribution to economic and social development, your one billion members worldwide, and the ethos that guides your work, this certainly is an idea worth considering. FAO will support it. Thank you. Well, Mr. Graciano de Silva, I know I speak for everyone here when I say thank you, not just for your words today, but for your work throughout the year on a cause of, of such importance to all of us. Uh, as you know, cooperatives have demonstrated that they can increase uh, agricultural production and decrease food waste, and we're all about sustainability, and we're very committed to the challenge that you set out of ending hunger. Um, I know I also speak for everyone here when I, uh, when I say thank you. We like your thinking about the Nobel Peace Prize, and we want to fan that flame, and we thank you for helping to spark that. Uh, we will follow up on that and appreciate the FAO's support for that. We'd like to present you with a, a, a special book that was commissioned for the International Year of Cooperatives. It's called Building a Better World, 100 Stories of Cooperation. And this is a, a beautifully bound and illustrated uh, book of 100 stories of cooperatives around the world. Thank you. Okay, we'll go in front of you.